Um, good morning, everybody. Um, no, no need to add to, to anything regarding um, the Rising Tide Community Loan Fund. Um, other than, you know, we cover a five county area. So for small businesses in Lehigh, Northampton, Carbon, Monroe, or the upper portion of Bucks, um, the Rising Tide, which is a nonprofit agency, is here um, and able to assist small business owners um, to try to get them the either the technical assistance or the financial assistance that they need. Okay, Dave Myers, you're going to take over as moderator. Victor, um, would you like to add? You said you had some slides. Well, would have to, but uh, basically, uh, I started America Bank in 2004. We are a systems integration. So basically, we provide technology for small to medium sized businesses in the areas of IT, cybersecurity, AV, digital signage, and uh, audiovisual. And we work a lot with the Chamber, the Red Cross. I'm a member of the American Red Cross Board, uh, Symphony Hall, uh, Hispanic Center, uh, and Valley Youth House. So we, we help uh, nonprofits uh, with some in kind uh, pro bono work uh, for the AV events. And, and that's it. Okay. Okay. So let me restate the question. What trends uh, within your field do you see emerging because of the COVID-19 pandemic? And who'd like to take that first, Chris or Victor? Victor, feel free. Sure. No, obviously when uh, last March, uh, the biggest trend was remote working from a technology perspective. Uh, even though we've been implementing the video conferences some of the last 10 years. Uh, some of our clients were already using video conferencing and remote working, but obviously there was a lot of clients that we need to, to, to do, uh, to set them work remotely. Uh, the biggest trend is um, much more cybersecurity focus, uh, not just the VPN, but the environment at the home. And obviously now, uh, Video conferencing is pretty much part of our work, and I don't believe uh, that even for some of the meetings that they will continue to be hybrid, part live, you know, part uh, virtual. Uh, I think uh, people are, you know, right now studies said about 50% feel comfortable working at least partially from home. Uh, so I think it's how do you adapt your business model uh, to a to a basically a uh, commuting, telecommuting uh, model, if it fits your needs, of course. So that's the biggest trend, which I'm sure is not a surprise to a lot of you. Chris? Chris? Yeah, since um, 2001, the Rising Tide has basically been a loan program uh, where we provided funding to small businesses. Um, when the pandemic hit last March, you know, we've totally had to morph it and now People aren't seeking loans; um, they're seeking grants. Um, so we've been we've had to switch gears, and, and we've had to provide one. We're administering some grant programs, but two, we've had to help our, our participants navigate through the grant process. Um, you know, in the PPP and, and the idle loans and, and things such as that. So we've had to do a whole 180 um, and, and re, you know redirect our, our resources and, and you know get ourselves trained to some degree to help people. And we're not doing anywhere near today what we did a year ago. Um, and, and I don't know how long that's going to last, to be honest with you. Um, as more and more resources are being made available, um, understandably, you know, people are going to look for a grant before they, they need to take on debt. It's, it's a scary time for debt right now. Um, so, you know, we're just here to try to make sure that we're able to provide the assistance that the small business owner needs because it, it can be a challenge um, to understand and navigate through this system. But that's, that's been the biggest change for us. Okay. Um, if anybody, um, Victor, if you have a couple of slides you want to go over first uh, that might stimulate some questions, um, you can share. Um,
Uh, sure. Uh, it's mainly a couple of intros on our company and a couple of resources that a lot of entrepreneurs should uh, look into. Yeah. So if you, if you do that, then we'll get into the Q&A, which is the bulk of today. Uh, a little bit different than a normal 1 million cups. Okay. I assume you guys can see it now? Yeah, we can, I can see it. Okay. So again, uh, our company is uh, basically a systems integration company and we focus in six areas, AV, digital signage, IT, telecommunications, such as phone systems, video surveillance and web development. Uh, one of the aspects that I was part of that I thought it was a great program is the Goldman Sachs 10,000 small business. And basically is for uh, small companies or entrepreneurs to help them scale their business. Uh, it's a free program you can apply and I highly recommend it. And as most of you know, one of the biggest values is the networking value. Uh, meeting other business owners that they have similar challenges to yours. So I highly recommend that you look into it and, and be part of this group. Uh, I believe when I did it, uh, I was the first one from the Lehigh Valley to participate. Uh, it's like a 12 week program and I had to drive to Philadelphia to, to do the program. Uh, it was based on the uh, Babson College Entrepreneur uh, curriculum. So I highly recommend it. So you got to apply, present what your scaling idea is, and based on that, they'll accept you or they don't. But uh, definitely you should look into it. The other one, this is more for Latino based businesses, this is another program I did through the Stanford uh, Business School. And basically, again, with the same kind of concept of helping Latino business uh, grow. Obviously, Stanford Business is other programs you could attend, but for my Latino businesses, I would definitely recommend that you look into it. Uh, they have over 700 employees and uh, you have to go to Stanford for a, a few days and then the rest was remoted. So another great program. And another one that I don't, I don't have a slide for is Aaron Stern Young uh, has another uh, program for entrepreneurs uh, that is free and and they got great sessions. So those are my three tips of the day, I guess, <laughs> that you can, uh, you know, uh, resources that you should definitely look into. That's all I have. Okay. Okay. Um, well, you can unshare then and um, uh, unless there's something that, um, so the first question that I see and if you, if I overlooked uh, anybody, uh, feel free to speak up. Uh, Tony asked uh, for either of you, what is the biggest challenge to obtaining a grant? I guess I'll tackle that one first. Right now it is, it is, you know, every grant has got some restrictions to it. You know, it may be a location, it may be the industry, it may be what you're using the funds for. So again, it's just understanding the legislation, how it's written. Um, and, you know, then making sure, you know, the, the challenge that we're seeing is small business owners, unfortunately, are just not prepared for what's always required. Um, you know, the legislation is often written such that you must provide X, Y, or Z in a certain format. And, you know, for example, right now, the, the grant program that we're ministering for Lehigh Northampton County, it was written that the small business owner must provide quarterly statements um, documenting their revenue for the last two years. A lot of small business owners don't have that information. You know, they keep their records, they throw it in a shoebox and drop it on their accountant's desk once a year. Um, and, and that works for them until you have this opportunity now where um, during this short window of time, you can apply for this grant and you have to have this documentation or you're not eligible. Um, so that's the biggest challenge that we have seen is one, understanding the language. And then two, it's often that you need to be prepared before the grant opens up. It's hard to get ready once it's open because the clock's ticking. 
and the demand. Uh, demand always exceeds what's available. Um, that's that's inevitable, unfortunately. Um, so again, if if you're scrambling right now to get your paperwork together, um, while that clock's ticking and other people are are getting you know their their chunk of the pie, it makes it tougher for you to get to gain access to those funds. That's that's what we're seeing. Victor, do you have any feedback on that or move to the next question? Yeah, move to the next question. That's not my area okay. of expertise. <laughs> okay. Um, Tony asked another question. Are companies more willing to boost their internet security? If so, in what areas? I guess that's more for me. Uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely I've seen a trend. Uh, you know, there was the rush in March to June of people getting remotely and uh, they didn't take as many cybersecurity options. Uh, a lot of people thought that just having a VPN from your home computer to the office network was enough. But if that home machine is not protected or has been compromised, you basically give them a direct tunnel to your uh, business network. So there's a lot of steps they're doing it. I do see a lot of trend. Finally, uh, businesses taking cybersecurity and ins cybersecurity insurance seriously, uh, which is something a lot of people don't think uh, that it's going to happen to them, you know. Uh, and I've seen a lot, especially with email phishing training. So it's been in a lot of areas. Uh, phishing training has been pretty popular. Uh, obviously, using the VPN uh, helps, but it's to make sure that. Uh, all your uh, security points are covered, even as I mean, a multi-factor authentication has been a good, a good trend, uh, but even that is being, uh, you know, even questioning right now. So cybersecurity is just moving a lot faster than uh, that we all want. Uh, not sure if you guys know, but cybersecurity is already almost twice the drug, uh, the drug trade. Uh, in, in revenue. So that's just something to be said. Uh, so uh, hopefully I answer your question. Yeah, that's a yes, Tony. Um, okay, uh, the next question is from Giersch. Many small businesses have suffered recently due to the economic downturn. Consequently, negatively, uh, impacting their business credit or personal credit score. What advice do you have for them? I guess I'll start with that one. Um, you know, my, my advice to you there is you're going to have to find your financial institution or find a financial institution that's willing to work with you. And that is willing to look just beyond this short period of time where obviously we've all been impacted. Um, you know, there will be some that simply look at the number and look at your credit score and see that your credit score today isn't what they want it to be. And then there are others that will go back and, and look more at your history and say, okay, look, you know, I could tell you got impacted by, by COVID. Um, things were good beforehand. I can see you're coming out of it. You know, we're willing to work with you. And I think you just have to find the right institution. Um, that's willing to do that because there's, there's nothing that stops your bank or credit union from, from making that decision. Okay. Um, it's just whether or not, you know, they're willing to take the time and the effort and that you're more than just a number to them. Okay. And, you know, hopefully they'll, they'll do a little bit of research and, and, you know, what, we got to see what the impact of this is. Once we come out of this, what are the banks and, and the credit unions going to do from a lending standpoint? 2008, when we came out of the recession, they really tightened the screws for a while, and it was very difficult to get a loan. Um, you know, what's it going to be when this ends? Um, I don't think we know that yet today, but um, there are there are good local banks in particular out there. Um, you know, just find the right one. That, that'd be my suggestion. From my from my point of view, uh, about three years after I started the company, I, I landed a huge project. And this client um, kind of burned us by saying that they went over budget, that they couldn't pay us. And obviously uh, some of our vendors were unhappy, but the key was communication. I explained to them, I, I read it, a letter from the clients saying what, what has happened and they delay and work with me on 
on fixing it. So I think the key is talk to all your creditors. Uh, obviously, you got, <laughs> you got a great excuse with the COVID-19, but it's communication. Uh, I negotiated, you know, delay before they reported the bad credit, you know, with them, and it did not impact me. So I think, like uh, Chris said, talking to your creditors and financial institutions is the key, uh, but try to do sooner than later, because uh, that's my advice from my, my own experience. So hopefully that helps. I think in, in part, we've already addressed this a little bit, but it's a much broader question. When starting up a business, can you discuss lending resources? Now we've talked about, um, Chris mentioned uh, personal banks, but is there other resources available for startups? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, you know, the Rising Tide is known as a community development financial institution, a CDFI. Um, and we're located throughout the country. And that is basically, you know, I can only speak for our organization, but the majority of, of CDFIs are, are very similar. We only work with those that are not bankable uh, with the ultimate goal of getting you to your bank. Um, so we do lend to startups, to existing businesses that for whatever reason are not yet bankable um, with, as I said, the goal of getting you and, and turning you over to your bank somewhere down the road. So we work with the banks, not against them. Um, so it, 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 there are those resources out there. You just have to, you know, find the right one. Um, but you know, there, there's a lot of other programs, you know, Victor mentioned in Goldman Sachs that may not be lending, but it, it you know, it helps. Okay. Um, your counties often have loan programs, um, here in the, in the Valley, we have the Lehigh and Northampton counties revolving loan fund. Um, often a city will have a loan program. Um, the city of Bethlehem has a loan program. The city of Allentown has a, a smaller program. Um, so, you know, just check with your, you know, your local area, um, check with the CDFI, check with your bank. Um, you know, there's a lot of good bankers out there that, you know, if they're not able to help you with the financing you need, um, they still want to work with you and they'll direct you to those that can help you. Um, so, you know, I know we've got some bankers on here and they, they've done a nice job. They'll refer people to the rising tide and they know that will help them get them to the point where, okay, for example, TD Bank now can work with them and, and we'll get those individuals back to that bank. Um, so, you know, as Victor said, communicate with your banker, um, you know, that can lead to a lot of positive avenues. But um, yeah, Dave, there's, there's plenty of help out there financially for those that are starting out. One uh, recommendation that I would probably add is uh, is check with your industry, whatever industry you're going to start your business on. The best resources is your industry organizations. Join them, and because they're very specific about whatever industry, whether it's the restaurant industry or IT or whatever it case might be, those are probably the best uh, uh, resources you can get. Where they'll tell you everything that applies to your industry. So recommendation there. Okay, um, ready to move to the next one. Uh, this is from Mike. Uh, Chris Hudock, do you anticipate the, the CHIRP grant? I don't know if you pronounce that chirp, but that's the way it's written. Grant will revise the application process, making it easier for those owners. So the CHIRP program, uh, which is for the uh, grant that's available for the accommodation in the food and beverage industries right now. Uh, Mike, to your point, um, it's the way the law is written. So it's kind of difficult to change it. Um, you know, the, our hands are tied. You know, the legislation states you must do A, B, and C. Had a conversation with staff of, of a state um, senator the other day. They're talking, uh, but unfortunately, the earliest that they will entertain that is going to be late May, and the program has to cease taking applications unless they extend the deadline um, in mid-June. So that doesn't give a whole lot of time for them to make changes to the way they wrote the law and then for applicants to get through the process. Yeah, so Chris, um, that's, uh, that'd be a little bit different than the PPP loans that came out where the SBA constantly rewrote their I guess, interpretation and, and language uh, under the law. 
Yeah, this they're, they're not modifying as to, on the fly. I was told at the earliest it would be late May if they did anything at all. Okay. Yeah. Um, and quite honestly, you know, to get to the point, a lot of people, the way this was written, it was not beneficial for the counties to run this program out until that June deadline. So I know a few areas where the application is already closed mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the counties received absolutely no funding from the state to run this program. Um, they had to pass it on to others um, and, and there's limited funds to operate this. So it's not in the financial interest of every organization to drag this out for months. Um, you know, Lehigh Northampton County, we're keeping it open to me. I'm sorry, June 15th as stated, but I know other counties that already closed it. Okay, they, they just wanna get this wrapped up um, because it, it, it's cumbersome and it, it made it a challenge the way it was written. Um, so they just said, let's get the money out as quick as possible. And, you know, we'll help those that we can and those that we can't help. Unfortunately, that's the way it was written. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate your insight. Okay. The next question is, uh, do the people who are administering the grant give feedback to the government regarding the hurdles they are creating for the small business to access the grant money? Yeah, I can say they hear from us way too often and they're probably really tired of hearing from us. I think the bigger question is whether or not they listen. Okay. Um, so we're definitely loud. Um, you know, and, and I tell I tell every applicant that is either, you know, precluded from applying because of some technicality and, and there's definitely some technicalities with, with the latest program and, and they're all well intended. So I don't mean this critically of, of, our, of our elected officials. Um, you know, they, they got hit with something none of us were prepared for and everybody's scrambling and everybody's screaming for help and everybody's doing the best they can. Um, but that feedback is going back, you know, to, to everybody. Um, it's just sometimes it's, there's not a whole lot you can do. And, you know, there, there, there is only so much help that can be out there. Um, and it will never be enough, unfortunately, but yes, they're, they're hearing, they're hearing it and, you know, certainly, you know, you should reach out to your elected officials, yeah. you know, and, and better they hear from you than they hear from me. Okay. Uh, because, you know, you are their people, you know, they represent you. Okay. So, you know, make sure, you know, and, and when they help you, it's nice to, for them to hear a thank you. Okay. But when something's not working, you should let them know that. Okay. Um, Victor, this would probably be in, in, in your uh, area. Where can one obtain cybersecurity? I, I take it cybersecurity tools or cybersecurity insurance. Most of your insurance brokers can uh, provide cybersecurity insurance. Uh, just make sure you understand the coverage. Uh, There's some cyber, cyber, cybersecurity insurance that if you're not meeting some basic uh, best practices with your IT uh, infrastructure, uh, the insurance is not going to cover you. You know, it's like leaving your doors open and uh, stuff like that. So it's important that you review. Uh, in fact, there's some that they provide cybersecurity insurance, but ransomware is an option. So just make sure you understand from what you're getting and what do you need to do to make sure you're in compliance with policy. Uh, from a cybersecurity tools, I would recommend if you have an IT company that they do an IT assessment and see what you may be lacking and make some recommendations. Uh, or if you feel your IT company is too comfortable, uh, maybe talk to another company uh, to do an IT assessment. So it's kind of like having an auditor to make sure that your uh, infrastructure is really secure. Uh, and again, it's all about managing risk, right? You don't need to have the security of the Department of Defense, but at the same time, you know, buying a, a home router to protect your business and your data, probably not the smartest thing to do. So it's all about managed risk and what would happen where your data is located uh, and what can you afford. So you should have your own disaster recovery plan what happens in the case of a disaster, the house burns down, the office burns down, uh, somebody stole my server, you know, what would you do? You know, just, just spend half an hour thinking about what would you do if you have no access to your data, 
uh, or your phone or your email. If your email is compromised, you may not get email. Imagine once I get a hold of your phone, I, your email, I'm good. I'm going to find out which bank to use. I'm going to reset the passwords and I'm golden. I'm, you know, I pretty much stole your identity. So uh, hopefully <laughs> answer some of the questions. It was a little broad, but hopefully uh, it was helpful. Yeah, that th there's a lot to take into consideration there. And uh, Brandon asked, or are, are there grant specialists that that he could get in touch with that can help him preparation before applying for the current grant? That's his current struggle. So resources for grant preparation, I guess, is the uh, question. Yeah, I, I would, you know, it, it's hard for there to be an expert in a grant because every grant's different, okay? And, and they often come quick. And as I mentioned earlier, they're, you know, they've got their own little quirks to it. I would say locally, probably the, the place that's done the best with keeping up on the various grants and, and, and has made sure they've had some staff to help people um, has been the Small Business Development Center up at Lehigh University. Um, you know, they make sure that they've, you know, they, they kept abreast of what's out there and, and have had staff there to help you navigate through the process. Um, you know, there are others on this call, I, I, you know, and, and Garisha or, or Lou could speak. I don't know if SCORE has been trying to keep up on the different grants. Um, you know, at the Rising Tide, we've done what we could. Um, you know, we, we administered the statewide one, so we certainly were in tune with that one and with this CHIRP. But I got to be honest, we weren't, you know, when the counties were running ones earlier through, or I guess it was last year now, um, through the um, local chamber, um, you know, we were focused on the state program. So we weren't tuned in as to what they were going, you know, going through locally. So, um, you know, if, if SCORE's got some insight as to what help they can provide, I think that would be good other than, you know, like I said, the SPDC up at Lehigh has done a decent job. Well, I would uh, recommend to the uh, <clears throat> to the listeners to the group here that if you are uh, looking for a grant, uh, also take a serious look at the SBA and the various loan programs and grants that they have. Uh, some of them are tailored to specific uh, uh, segment of the uh, uh, of the population, meaning whether it's a women-owned business. Uh, or a veteran-owned or disabled veterans, et cetera. So they, they, they have, uh, uh, you know, set up uh, <clears throat> specific uh, uh, targets that they can uh, help uh, uh, people looking for grants. And then also on their, uh, <clears throat> uh, through the SBA, you can, you can talk to somebody locally and get some insight as to what uh, you need to fulfill in terms of uh, getting an, uh, approval for the for the grant. Okay, uh, <clears throat> and this is drilling down just a little bit more. Stacy was asking, and I think Chris basically answered this. Um, as a rising tide, consider put together a resource to help small business prepare for the possibility of applying for future grant money, prep now to request later, and scores um, here had also commented on it. And there's uh, DJ is here from SBDC at Lehigh. So from my perspective, I think those are a couple of different resources. Is there anybody else that uh, has any suggestions about that? Or Chris, are you anticipating bringing somebody on board for that? So we've got staff that can help individuals. Um, as I said, in terms of preparing something ahead of time, that's the challenge because we don't know what the legislation is going to require. Okay. Um, so it's, it's hard to foresee what they're going to ask for this time. Um, you know, as I said, when we did the statewide program, um, you didn't need to provide the quarterly documentation. Now, when they come out with the CHIRP program, they threw in, you've got to provide the quarterly documentation. So you never know what the next one's going to ask for that the previous one didn't. And, and that's, that's the challenge that everybody's facing. There's, there's just no, 
you know, it'd be nice if they'd come up with one program and just keep it that way and one set of requirements for every program going forward so we could help people be prepared and that you could start to focus on that. Um, but out of nowhere, unexpectedly, they'll make a change to it um, just be, for whatever reason. Um, but, um, you know, certainly if we know what's going to be coming down the road, yeah, we'll have staff available and we can always, you know, more than happy um, to put together some kind of a resource, whether it's a webinar or some form of a paper and have those materials ready. It's just, we're not given much notice um, is the downside. And, and, you know, those who asked about the PPP, it literally changed multiple times. Um, you know, but there's bankers on here and, and that's, that's a real bad word PPP for the bankers. Uh, because just when you thought you knew what you needed and you could tell your clients, it literally would change the next night and then it would change two weeks from then and then it would change in another month. It's hard to prepare for that, unfortunately. Okay. Dave, if, if I may, uh, it's DJ Corman. Can I just address quickly the SBDC on this a little bit? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, as, as Chris said, um, we're one of the resources in the Valley for help like this. In our office, for those of you who don't know, we're kind of broken into different groups who specialize in different areas. And I know Alicia is on the call with me today or on this today. Both of us really work with startup organizations. People are just starting to, to get the process going. But we do have a, a, a CARES team that we call that was hired specifically to deal with this situation. We have um, Rob Minio is our finance guy. Daryl Wentz is another finance guy. And all the other CARE folks that we have there really are designed to, and to help people through this process. So. Um, as Chris mentioned, I think SCORE and SBDC together make an incredible team to, uh, to work on things like this. But if you're having questions, please reach out to us and, and I'm sure they'll put you in the, the, the hands of somebody over there that can help you. Well, I was hoping that would be your answer, DJ. So thanks. Um, and, and I think there are a lot of resources. You just have to be able to ask the questions. Um, Lou, Lou kind of said, yeah, we, we need to explore this a bit. Uh, just be, and Chris, of course, mentioned that things are constantly changing. Matt from uh, TD said good advice. Go ahead. Did someone have a comment? Okay. Um, Tony and Victor, we didn't forget about you. So this question's to you. What is the process and cost for a technology consultation? Well, I think most IT companies will give you free consultation. Uh, I think they should approach you with understanding what your current position is and where, where are you trying to go? Uh, so I can recommend on it. So, but yeah, I think if you contact most IT companies in the Lea Valley, they'll, they'll give you a free consultation. And, and, you know, I would do at least two separate companies and, and see what each one can provide. You know, we particularly use uh, IT assessment tools that look at your whole network and we can find out, you know, that uh, the payroll folder is open to all the employees, for example. Believe it or not, that's a pretty common one uh, that, you know, they have ac the access controls are not set up correctly or their firewall is totally open uh, or the Wi Fi has a password of one, two, three, four, you know, so just. It's amazing what you find, but uh, if the IT company is not offering you to run an IT assessment to really look deep into it, and they just want to talk about what you need, and then that's probably not the company I would recommend. Uh, so, you know, to really do a, a good IT assessment, I would just have them uh, run at it. And like I said, most of the companies don't charge you at all, and you get a full report, and either you can take it back to your IT company and say, look, they found this, you know, how can we address it? If you got a good relationship with them, you know, uh, or if you want to consider the other IT company, the, the TA assessment, I think it's it balances out, you know, uh, from our point of view, we don't mind doing it. And if they, even if they don't, if they decide not to go with us, it's okay. At least they know that we did our best and hopefully, you know, down the road, they might consider us, you know, when, their contract expires or something to that effect. So it's a, it's, I think it's a win-win for both sides. 
Okay, uh, Santiago, I, I've seen a couple of your comments. So in about 10 minutes, we'll be talking about uh, announcements. So if you can cover those, your comments then, uh, that would be great. Uh, another uh, kudo for another bank that's on here, Kim Cramsey from Fulton Bank, and we have multiple people. This is one of the advantages of coming back to uh, uh, 1 million cups every week because you can network People need to put as much detail in the um, uh, chat section simply because when we send out the video, we also send out the chat. So um, you'll ha you'll have that information at your hand at, at, in your hands. Uh, Matt mentioned who uh, is a works with a bank, uh, saying your financial institution should be a good resource for helping protect your transactions against cyber attacks. But that's not all inclusive, I don't think, is what Tony was asking. But at any rate, uh, now Tony has another. Victor, can you give an example of a business data, how business data is compromised and what was the solution? So something that you've dealt with. There's so many examples, to be honest, you know, from, uh, from just basic so the typical, the most about 60% is through email phishing, uh, where people get a, and they're getting better and better. Uh, you know, one example was a CEO that got a, trying to do a money transfer, please transfer this to this account. Hopefully the banker got resolved it, but uh, so phishing is probably the most common one. Uh, one way to do it, because you can't trust your employees or even yourself. Uh, sometimes you're in a hurry, you click on email, it looks legit. Uh, we recommend uh, to get a email security uh, product. You know, one example is Proofpoint. So even if you click on it, they actually goes to their data center. They verify that it's not going to Russia or China. They test it. Obviously, this is in split seconds. And then, so they basically prevent you from and allows you to also send your emails encrypted. How many of you have sent financial information via email and you know, think that that's secure? Uh, so I would you know, have some kind of email uh, security uh, product that allows you to uh, encrypt and as well as verify your links would probably be the easiest and, and it's not expensive to do that. So hopefully that- Victor, can you name that email uh, protection again? Is that Proofpoint? Proofpoint is one of them. Uh, that's what we use. We found it to be. And uh, whenever it filters emails, you can set up a time. So at five o'clock, you said these are the emails that we did not thought they were. Uh, they were kind of questionable. So you can see if it's one from Tony, for example, I'll say, okay, this is a legit, then I can whitelist Tony. So now all the emails from Tony are good. But even if Tony's email gets hijacked after I approved her and she sends me a link, or it looks like she sent me a link, a proof point will validate whether that link is still not going to Russia or China or uh, on it. So uh, there are several products uh, that you can use. A proof point is just one of them. So did that answer your question, Tony? Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, Santiago had a, had another uh, comment, which it, it, it would he can incorporate with his announcements. But one of the good ideas of working collectively is you can talk about some potential issues, and and Santiago offers some co working and some entrepreneurial um, uh, networking opportunities. Um, our speaker from last week says, said, Victor, you mentioned that in the introduction that you have done pro bono work for nonprofits and um, they, uh, they work exclusively with nonprofits. Can you give her an idea of some pro bono services you've provided to uh, nonprofits in the past? Well, the, the biggest one that we do is uh, we do a lot of pro bono work or partial pro bono for doing their, their events. So with American Red Cross, the LLS, uh, United Way. So we help them do their life events 
uh, we're working with uh, uh, Hispanic Center. Uh, so that's one way to do it. And as well as we do some uh, IT pro bono work as well, as well as donating AV equipment or PC. So those are some of the areas that we help. That, that's the end of the questions that were in the chat. Hopefully I didn't overlook anybody. If I did um, speak up now, you can unmute. Uh, we have about five minutes or so before we get into announcements. So is there any other questions? Uh, Dave, can I add uh, for the nonprofits in the call, definitely yeah. check uh, techsoup.org tech soup and uh, basically provides uh, software, Microsoft software, hardware, uh, virtually no cost. Uh, so definitely all the nonprofits, that's one of the first resources we would check with our nonprofits are you using tech soup? Because they can get the, you know, a lot of licenses for free. Uh, I'll give an example. If you were wanted to buy Office 365, uh, the perpetual license was usually was four hundred dollars. They would get it for twenty bucks, so it's uh, it's definitely a good resource for nonprofits. Uh, Chris and Victor, uh, and I think I saw Chris's. I'm not sure if I saw Victor's, but be sure to put your contact information in the chat so when we send this out, people will have a a contact for you. Um, was there any other, Chris? or Victor, you can also comment on anything, but any other questions people might have? No, thank you for having me. And uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to email me and we'll see what we can do to help. These panels are very beneficial. Uh, Nicole is our scheduler. And uh, sometimes when we think there's gonna be a void, we'll incorporate a, a panel. Obviously, uh, we're going to try to get Nancy in, and we will probably get some other folks on that panel. Um, if there's any suggestions of, uh, of people that we might want to uh, get in for a panel discussion, but as you know, One Million Cups is, is presentations by individual entrepreneurs. Um, still waiting in case anybody has a question, unmute. Um, uh, Okay, any final comments, Chris, Victor? No, other than, you know, as, as Victor said, thanks for the time, I appreciate it. Um, you know, and, and if nothing else, you know, Victor said the key word, I think earlier, communicate, you know, regardless of what you need, um, just reach out to somebody, you know, whoever you trust on the financial side and, and you know, express the help that you need. Um, and whether it's cybersecurity, whether it's grant, whether it's a loan, um, you know, there's enough resources here in the Valley, just as you can see on this call, everybody works together very well. Um, just, you know, let somebody know what you need and the helps out there. Yeah, I must say that we're pretty privileged in the Lehigh Valley with all the resources from the, I know I got a great experience with SBDC, with the Allentown Economic Development. I think we're pretty, pretty lucky on all the resources that we have, uh, you know, from the chamber all the way to you know, so we're pretty lucky. Uh, and there's a lot of good people in the Valley, a lot of nonprofits doing a lot of great work. Uh, maybe sometimes a little too many nonprofits, but <laughs> but they're all doing great work. So happy to be here in the Lea Valley. Yeah, so thanks again. And Chris, uh, an extra thank you for coming to us on your recovery from COVID. Uh, you did a phenomenal job. You did a phenomenal job and uh, hopefully you'll be over the hurdle here soon. Um, 